Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Forbes contributor Bernadette Joy. The National Association of Realtors found that we have seen two months in a row of year-over-year home price declines. This comes after a 131-month streak of record increases. We are still seeing high inflation and low housing inventory continues to be an obstacle, and it hasn't fully recovered since the 2008 housing crash. Bernadette, simply put, is it a good time to buy a home right now? So in my opinion, for most Americans, I would wait until the real estate market cools. I don't think it's a great time right now. Can you walk us through your home ownership journey? Yeah, so I'm saying this as a current renter right now, but that was after I've owned three separate homes over the last 10 years. And I actually paid off all of those homes, largely in part because I was on a debt-free journey, because I was working towards financial independence, but I was also helped by having relatively low interest rates the last couple of years. And so uh, this is the first time as a millennial that I've been seeing interest rates as high as they are right now. And so that can be a shock for a lot of other, you know, new homeowners uh, that are similar age. And so uh, I actually intended on buying a home this year again, but when I saw the real estate market in my own city and started really researching and digging into what home prices look like in in the near neighborhoods that I was looking for, I decided, you know what, maybe now is a good time to wait and actually get myself into an even better financial position for when I'm ready to buy. When does it look like the market is going to cool? Because I know it must be a little disappointing for people who want to buy that home to put those dreams on ice. So what should they be doing in the meantime? When does it look like a good time to buy a house? Yeah, so it is tough, especially when you see your other friends, right, buying homes and you see a lot of these in in where I live, there's a lot of multiple offer situations. I have seen a little bit of a slowdown, at least where I am, where there isn't um, things going off the market quite as quickly or there are things that are um, not getting as many multiple offers or maybe they're actually just going for selling price instead of going way over asking. So I am seeing some signs of that. Uh, But one of the things that I like to tell people to do first is take this time to uh, go explore as many different neighborhoods and don't get so stuck on what you thought was your dream home. And you can do that by visiting at least three open houses a month. That's actually a goal that I do. My husband and I, that's our date. Our date days on Sundays, we'll just go look for open houses in our local area. And we kind of play our our own version of those home TV, you know, home TV shows. Yeah, house. it sounds like House Hunters. What do you like? What don't we we like? Um, And that's a really great way to still feel like you're keeping the process moving, not having the pressure of having a sales agent like right next to you trying to get you to buy, buy, buy but still do your research and like get to understand what's going on in your local market. So even if you're not intending to buy the home, you're saying play house hunters and go on over to any neighborhood and really take a look? Yeah, yeah. And that's actually based off of my own experience. The last home that I bought was actually from an open house. And I wasn't at that point intending to buy a home at that time. And the house that I ended up buying was nothing like what I had thought in my mind was the thing that I wanted to do. And so what I really like about you know, open houses is that, you know, it's a low pressure environment. You know, agents are expecting people to kind of just walk in and not expecting you to buy right there. But you might actually find some things that you didn't expect to like, or you might sign find some hidden gems that uh, didn't fall into your list of your original, you know, things that you wanted in a home. But also what I think is really important is that you don't want to go just off of the data of what you're seeing, like even in your city or what you see on the news, you really, it's really neighborhood by neighborhood. So even if one neighborhood is going really, really fast, there might be another neighborhood that's close by that maybe isn't as competitive. One of the other pieces of advice you have is learn how much interest you can save with a mortgage calculator. So I am, honestly, I'm not good with math. What variables should you be plugging in here? Yes. So the good news about the mortgage calculators is that you don't have to be good good at math. It'll do a lot of the math for you. But the four things that you usually are looking to put into a mortgage calculator is what is the purchase price that you're intending to buy a home at? What is the down payment that you are um, trying to put down on the house initially? What is the interest rate that you think you would be getting for the mortgage? And then what are the loan terms, meaning how many years on that mortgage do you want? And before you even buy a home, this is a great time while you're waiting for things to get a little less crazy in the market, is to play around with those numbers and actually see, well, if I get a lower term 
a mortgage, for example, instead of doing a 30 year, I did a 20 year or 15 year, how that changed my monthly payment. If I saved up a little bit more money right now, how much would that save me in interest? If I decided to buy a slightly, you know, cheaper house or even, you know, bump up my price, what would that do to my payments? And getting to do that in the mortgage calculator is really, really helpful. What I think most people do um, that I that I coach and that I've seen um, as students is that they'll just take what the bank says at face value and say, oh, here's what you can afford. And they go to the top of the range and they say, well, this is the monthly payment versus saying, well, if I play around with these factors, can I change my monthly payment and make it more affordable? Or can I make the house even cheaper in the long run by saving a ton of interest? So we have visit a few open houses a month, crunch the numbers in a mortgage calculator. Next, you have pay off your credit card. Why is this so important? Yes. So uh, this year, American consumer credit has hit an all time high. In February, it was over $4.8 trillion. And especially again, for people who are first time home buyers, there's a good chance that you might also have some debt whether it be student loans, but in particular credit card debt. And I want to preface that this is not to shame anyone. This is not to make anyone feel bad. If you have credit card debt, it doesn't mean that you messed up. It might have been that you had some unexpected expenses. A ton of people had things go ha happen during the pandemic, maybe you got laid off. And oftentimes the personal finance rhetoric is like, oh, if you have credit card debt, that means you're irresponsible. No, I actually have met a lot of people who have credit card debt because something bad happened and they needed it in a case of an emergency. So if you have any sort of credit card debt, uh, there's a couple of reasons why that's really helpful to pay off now. One is it'll help your credit score, right? So then you'll be able to get a better rate on your mortgage if you decide to get a mortgage to buy a home. It'll also free up some cash, right? So instead of making those minimum monthly payments, you'll have more money to put towards, even if it's not the down payment, towards buying nice things for your house, right? But you also start to build better money habits by paying down that credit card debt so that when you do have a mortgage and inevitably owning a home has a lot of unexpected costs, you'll build better money habits so that you're better prepared to be a, a more responsible homeowner. Let's break down those unexpected costs a little bit. Right now I'm a renter. So even if the light bulb isn't working, you know, ring, 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 I call my landlord. Hey, can you fix this for me? Hey, can you fix this sink? I'm the least handy person. So this works out really well for me. But when you buy a home, those unexpected costs are on you. What are some of the most popular common ones? I don't know if you want to call them popular because it definitely doesn't feel like <laughs> when we have them, right? The common ones, right, that I have often seen is um, uh, HVAC, which is really huge. So like if your air conditioning um, uh, or your heating system and stuff, um, those are things that come up maybe once every 10, every 10 or 20 years. But if it does come up, it's like tens of thousands of dollars uh, with a lot of the weather related type of stuff. Roof leaks are something that happens more often than people realize. But then there's also just those um, kind of everyday things that you don't expect to break down. So even for me, while I was in my uh, last home, my microwave, I accidentally exploded something in there. So that was my fault. But I still had to get <laughs> microwave. I uh, had my um uh, I had a family member put a uh, comforter inside our washing machine and the washing machine ended up leaking, right? So we had to get a whole new washing machine. And so sometimes it's not even things that you think are going to be like natural disasters or anything like that. It could just be breaking down of regular appliances. And again, so often people are not having enough of a contingency fund. Uh, when they own a home to expect those things, especially if you came from renting like you, right? You used to calling someone and saying, hey, can you fix this for me? But guess what? It's you <laughs> this time around. And so I highly, highly recommend for people, if you are going to own a home, if you are going to buy a home, that you should pay off your credit card debt and also have a contingency fund built because things inevitably will break down. Such great advice. And your next piece of advice, I really want you to break down for us because I want to know how you take advantage of this. You wrote increase your down payment passively with today's high interest rates. How do you do that? Yes. All right. So when we think of home buying, the most common narrative that we're hearing right now is like rates are really bad, right? For buying a more uh, buying a home and getting a mortgage. However, if you're someone who's saving up money right now, the high rates are actually in your favor. And so there's two ways that I've um, 
uh, shared with people and how you can do that. One is through high yield savings accounts. And those are so simple. Anyone can open up a high yield, high yield savings account. Uh, they're usually at banks that don't have a brick and mortar. So they're able to offer higher interest. And so usually when you get a savings account, it's usually like attached to your checking account and it gives you like 0.01%, which is nothing, right? But the lowest interest rates I've been seeing now for high yield savings accounts are like 3.6, 3.8% right now. So if you have, let's say, you know, $10,000 that you're saving up, like you're going to actually get like a good chunk of change just from the interest rate of just sitting there. And the second way that you can use the high yield savings accounts is using those good old fashioned certificates of deposit or CDs. And honestly, I didn't really pay much attention to them. I thought of them as things that like my parents used back in the day. Um, but all it is is simply a bank account that you put the money into and you have to let it sit there in order to grow the interest uh, for at least 10 months or to a year. And that's a great place to store your down payment while you're waiting to buy a home. And that's actually what I'm doing right now. I have money saved up in a high yield savings account and have money set, set aside in a CD. And once the CD matures, meaning that's when you can pull the money out and you get all the interest, it's time for when I'm going to plan to buy my next home, which is in 2024. But in that time, it's I'm going to get a couple hundred dollars. And actually, I think I'm going to get over a thousand dollars extra to put towards my house. That's great. And that would just be sitting there anyway. So at least it's sitting there making some money passively, correct? Exactly. And and the the downside, though, just to make sure that we're having a balanced conversation about this is with the high yield savings accounts, there really isn't that much downside. The only downside is that you might not be able to go to a physical bank if you're someone who wants to go to a physical bank. Um, but they have like ATMs and you can get stuff online. But with a CD, if you pull out the money earlier than the maturity date, then you might have to give up some of that interest. But both of them are really, really safe. And you just have to make sure it's at a bank that's FDIC insured and making sure that you know you don't put more than $250,000 in any of those bank accounts, which is a lot already. But if you're someone who's pay, um, saving up for down payment, you might actually have um, you know a big amount that you want to put in there. You generally don't want to put more than $250,000 per person on those accounts because then it goes past the insurance limit. Got it. And your final piece of advice, practice patience with yourself and your real estate agent. Obviously, it's easier said than done to practice patience with yourself. So how do you do this? Uh, you know, I would love to tell you that I'm really good at this, but I did go to the open houses this past weekend with my husband. And uh, we looked at some houses that were like, oh, wow, they are really nice, but they're definitely overpriced. But it would be really nice to have our friends here, right? And so one of the things that I strongly recommend is to build a relationship with a good real estate agent, someone who's going to understand that you are waiting for the right opportunity. For most real estate agents, this is a one-time transaction, right? This is like a one-time decision for them. But for you, that you have to live with this decision for a while, right? So the one finding a real estate agent who isn't going to pressure you, who's still going to work with you, even if you're not buying right now, the best real estate agents that I've worked with are the ones who'll still send me listings, even though I'm saying like I'm, I'm on ice right now. And um, the other piece is to have an honest conversation with yourself about why it is that you're buying a home. And this happened to me just this past weekend. I said to myself, if I'm being honest, the main reason that I want to buy this particular really shiny, bright <laughs> home is because it's probably more about, uh, you know, kind of what it looks like from a social status versus it actually being a good money decision. And so when I actually sat down and I read the numbers and I grounded myself in, okay, why am I buying a home? Then it was easier to wait on it because I realized, you know, there's going to be other houses. This is not going to be the last house that I see. And I have bigger goals. Um, for my financial independence, not just to, you know, buy a house that might be out of my means. I have a question for you. Obviously, buying a home is one of the biggest financial investments you could ever make in your life. So when you're going, let's say you are finally ready or financially ready to do this, and you're going through a home and it's checking off most of your boxes, would you, is there such thing as a perfect home that checks off everything? Or would you say, okay, this checks off maybe 75% of my priorities, that's a good investment for me. Yeah, so you're close on the ratio that I like to use. Um, there's a there's kind of like this golden rule called the Pareto rule, the 80-20 rule, right? That says that, uh, you know, kind of 80% of our success comes from 20% of like our effort. And I kind of use that same rule when buying a home of like, you have to get out of your mind that likely, even, even if you had an unlimited budget, 
it's very hard to find the, actually the most perfect home. And most people, have a, most people like you and I have limited budgets, right? And so I like to think of it 80-20 of, if, I, if this can check off 80% of my list, then I can live with the 20%, right? That maybe doesn't check off all the boxes, but that 20% can't be the non-negotiables. So I just to give you as an example, it's kind of random, but my husband and I are really set on having a bathtub in our next home. Uh, we just really like taking bubble baths. I love that. And funny enough, most new builds don't have bathtubs, right? And so we, we had to have a conversation to say, okay, well, is that a non-negotiable for us, right? And so that actually knocked out a lot of the contenders on our list, but it made it slightly easier to look for a home because we're saying, well, if that's really a non-negotiable for us, then it narrows down the pool. So as a uh, home buyer, if you're ready to buy, have your list of three non-negotiables, whether it's like, oh, I must have a big kitchen or I must have a big yard for my dog or I must have a bathtub like me, and then be willing to be flexible on the other things that aren't your non-negotiables. I, first of all, love that non-negotiable, but those are important, especially when you're in your home every day, you're going to be potentially in your home for years. You want to enjoy your life there. Yes, yes. And I would also say that I, it's really hard sometimes to articulate what's non-negotiable for you versus what other people are pressuring you to do. And so in my family, as an example, uh, I, there's a lot of pressure to just buy a bigger house right? Because bigger house means you're more successful, right? It means you have more money. It looks like you're richer. Yeah, it's a status but, symbol yeah. for sure. Right, right. And I think that's for a lot of people. Um, but for me, actually a non-negotiable was having a home that uh, I could maintain, that I felt like I could maintain without being stressed out. And so for me, that actually meant downsizing. So I went from a 2000 square foot house at one point, and then I went down to 1200 uh, square feet and it felt a lot more manageable. And so I really encourage people who are watching to consider, well, even though it might be something that other people value, that doesn't really matter. I'm the one who has to live here. So even if it doesn't match what other people think is successful or is what should be you know, good in a home, it should really just matter what matters to you. Bernadette, I really appreciate you coming back, providing your insight here. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I hope you come back soon. Thank you, Bernadette Joy. Thanks for having me.